Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Peter Marshall. I work for Commerce Decisions, professional services director there. I'm going to be talking about value for money and achieving value for money uh, in large, large procurements. And I think I'm really going to be answering two questions or exploring two questions. The first of those is, are we using techniques? Do we have techniques uh, to make sure that we are getting value for money out of our suppliers on major procurements? Um, are there problems with some of the techniques we use? I think there are, and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk about them. And I'm also going to try and answer the question, well, what can we do about that? How can we actually fix some of those problems? I think some of what I'm going to say is actually probably a bit controversial. I hope I'm not going to upset anyone in the audience here. Um, I'm going to try and prove some of the things I say. Um, what I'm doing here, though, is I'm, I've been in this industry 15 years, and so I'm drawing here upon 15 years of experience working with all sorts of major procurement projects across a, a wide remit of public sector and private sector. I've worked with bidders, I've worked with buyers, I've worked in the private sector, public sector, but mainly major procurement programs. And I've had the real luxury of being able to totally focus in on how we evaluate tenders, how we evaluate bidders, and if you like, the detailed maths and the mechanics of that bit of the procurement process. And because I've spent 15 years doing that, I've understandably really been able to you know, get the things straight in my head. So the stuff, what I'm going to try and do today is really bring out some clear examples of where I think there are problems in stuff we do. But in fact, it's a really complicated, difficult subject area, which is why I think you know, we, we, we as an industry can get to a point where we're doing things that maybe have flaws, but people aren't spotting. The first thing I just want to talk about briefly, it's almost a bit of an aside, but I want to just talk about how we engage with industry, because I think some of the issues to do with getting value for money out of our suppliers start even before we do the evaluation as suppliers. Um, it seems to me that for most of the for most buying teams, for most procurement teams, if you're in the public sector, the thing you are most worried about is the risk of challenge. When, if, I, if, I, if I go to most buyers and say, what are you worried about? What do you think the major risks are to your procurement? Most public sector people would say, well, the risk of challenge. And most private sector people would say, well, getting value for money, you know. Um, most people would agree somewhere at the top of that list of risks is meeting the procurement timescales. It doesn't matter whether you're in the public sector or the private sector. There's a real tendency to say, right, we need this thing in service by, we need this thing delivered or bought by this date. Uh, therefore, we need to have completed the invitation to tender and have a preferred supplier by, you know, a date that's two months before that so we've got time to get in contract and, and reverse that back to a point we've got to get the PQQ out of the door in, you know, two weeks' time. And... Um, but I think the risk that we often fail to think about or realise even as a risk is the risk that we don't get what we need. We'd end up not buying what we actually need because we don't engage with industry up front enough. So there's a real tendency, in my experience, to not talk to industry early enough in the procurement process. That's either because we're worried about jeopardising the competition and getting a challenge. That's certainly the case in the public sector. Um, and so we don't talk to industry. Another way of putting that is procurement's kind of, maybe, it, it seems to me there's, 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 there's two stakeholders in the procurement. There's the end users who are really worried about getting the thing they need. And then there's the procurement team doing the procurement who are much more worried about the risk of challenge. Uh, and, and those risks don't align up. That perception of the risk doesn't line up. So I think what we need to do is get the end users more involved in the procurement process and talking to the potential supply base before we've written the requirements, before we've written the criteria that we're going to use to evaluate the tenders. So if we don't do this, what, what ends up happening is we end up buying sometimes the wrong solution. We make assumptions about how we're going to solve our problem, what we need to do it, what we're going to buy. And we also perhaps buy those solutions in unnecessarily expensive ways. So I, I, a real example I'm drawing upon here is um, a, 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 one of my customers who were, were buying an IT system. It was replacing an existing IT system. They knew there was going to be 100 users of the system from day one, but that their mission was to grow the usage base of this new system up to about 1,000 users after about three years. That was why they were putting in place this, pro this procurement. Um, so they, need, they, they, they had a requirement, they'd identified a requirement for this system to scale and grow. And so they made a, one of the criteria in their 
procurement in their evaluation of bidders, the scalability of the solution, scalability, can it grow? Um, but they did that. They just arbitrarily decided to have a question in the ITC about scalability. And what that meant is there were a whole load of potential suppliers who did not have systems that at that time were scalable up to 1,000 users. And they ended up with one, one potential supplier, which was the only supplier who had a system who could do with 1,000 users at that point in time. Now, my point here is this. If at that point they'd engaged with industry and worked that out, they might have thought, well, hang on, an alternative approach here is to buy a solution from somebody who can deal with 100 users now, but buy it from somebody who can make the system scalable in the next three years. They've got the resources, a good plan, the experience of doing it, all the right things in place, so that we meet the need to have 1,000 users catered for in three years' time. That would have opened the market up to three or four new vendors. It might have got a much better value for money solution. They didn't do that because they didn't know that was an issue, and they didn't know it was an issue because they hadn't engaged with industry early enough. So that's, I think, the first thing that, uh, for me, jeopardizes value for money. It sounds academic, but I, you know, I've seen project after project where I work with suppliers who say, if my customer had talked to me up front and relaxed this requirement slightly, I could have saved 20% of the cost. It's not happening necessarily. We can do it. Even in the public sector, we can do it. The public contracts regulations as they stand allow us to do it, even though we are worried about doing it in a way that doesn't jeopardize the competition. And of course, the new version of the public contracts regulations coming along make it even clearer how we can do this without jeopardizing the competition. But I want to go on now and talk about other things that I think we don't get quite right that don't, don't mean, we, or rather mean we don't get value for money out of our suppliers. And this is where I'm going to start talking about how we evaluate our suppliers. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and make three points here. The first two of them I'm going to prove, or try and prove here for you. And the first of them is that I think we use scoring and weighting mechanisms that we do not fully understand. Sounds controversial, but let me show you what I mean. Um, so a fairly typical way of doing an evaluation of suppliers might look like this. We're going to weight price and technical. In my experience, uh, uh, often the, the, the most common split is 40% price, 60% technical. We need to know how we're evaluating the technical part of the bid. Uh, I've suggested a scoring scale that's got acceptable at 60%, really good at 100%. And we need a way of taking the prices from industry or whole life costs or whatever and turning them into scores. A very common way of doing that is to, give, is to use that formula, which gives the cheapest tender full marks for price, and it gives all the other tenders a pro rata score. So if you're twice as expensive, you get half the marks. Okay? That is a common way of doing it. That is probably, for me, the most common way of each of these three things being done. But what have we committed to? Um, just before I go any further, can you please stick your hands up? If you think, so on, on the left of those scales, we have a £1 million cheap acceptable tender. And on the other side, we have a more expensive tender that is excellent. It's a really good tender. But what I want to do is uh, just, just gauge how much more everyone thinks we're going to end up paying according to that for the better tender. So if you think we'll pay, say, up to £300,000 more for the better tender compared to the £1 million tender, stick your hand up now. Okay. If you think it's going to be £300,000 to £600,000 more, please stick your hands up. Okay. £600,000 to £1 million more. A million to a million and a half more. There's not many hands going up here. A million and a half to two million. Okay, right. I'm going to stop there. Or two, two million to three million. Fine, okay. We had a couple of hands go up there. Uh, but let me show you the fact. In my experience, when I ask this to my customers and say, how much more do you think you should pay for a, high co for a really good solution compared to an acceptable solution? In my experience, people say, I don't know, 1.3 million. 1.2 million, I'll pay a couple of hundred thousand pounds more, I'll pay 20% more, 30% more, okay? That's what I was kind of expecting to see you guys say. Right, I'm going to get a couple of volunteers up here to show this example, so perhaps if I could get you two coming up, uh, please. Um, so to go through this, I'm going to just do the maths and show you what this means in practice. So, um, madam, you are the green tender, so you are an acceptable tender that costs one million pounds on the left, and sir, so you are an excellent tender, okay? And what we're going to do is just do the maths now to work out how much more we could end up paying for this really good tender. We've got everything we need to do this. So for the green bid, it's acceptable, which means it gets 60% of the, of the points allocated to technical. Okay? That means 
it gets, if you can hold that in front of acceptable, please, it gets 36 of the 60 points available for technical. It's also the cheapest tender. And because it's the cheapest tender, it gets all of the marks avail available for price. Okay? And so it has got 76 points overall. Okay? Moving to the red tender, it's excellent, which means it gets all of the marks available for technical. It gets all 60 points for technical. Okay? Now, if this were to cost £2 million, pounds, if you can hold that one in your other hand for a minute, please, sir. If it were to cost £2 million, pounds, then it would get half the marks for price. It's twice as expensive. It would get half the marks for price, or 20 marks. If you, sorry, that, that one just needs to go in front of there, please, sir. And so it would score 80 points overall. It's the winner. If, if it costs two million, if it's twice as expensive, it's a clear winner. It's, it's four points ahead of the green one. OK? If, on the other hand, it would cost two and a half million pounds, it's now two and a half times as expensive as the green one, which means, according to the formula, it gets 16 points out of the 40 points. OK? So now, at that, at that, uh, at that price point, it, it gets the same overall score of 76 points. Okay? So, in other words, when the red bid is worth t is co costs two and a half million time, uh, two and a half million pounds, two and a half times as much, it gets the same score. It's another way of saying we are willing to pay up to two and a half million pounds for this solution compared to a million for an acceptable solution. And yet, if I asked most people how much more they would be willing to pay for this solution, they'd pay 20% more, 30% more, 40% more. So my point is simply that we use a scoring mechanism. Thank you. Um, sit down for a second, if you don't mind, please. So my point here is simply that we are using a scoring mechanism that I think we do not necessarily fully, fully understand. Now, this chart just takes that a bit further. What, what this chart is showing you over on the left is our acceptable solution. And as you go over to the right, you're moving to the excellent solution, which was the red one over here. And the, the blue line is showing us how much more we're willing to pay. So to go all the way from acceptable to excellent, we're willing to pay an additional 150%, which is two and a half times as much. That's an additional 150%, okay? This, if you work the maths through, this is what you get, this shape of line. And my point on this is simply that, look, to go halfway there, you only have to pay 43% more. But to go all the way there, you have to pay another 100% more. So we're willing to pay 43% more for the first 20% improvement and 100% more for the second 20% improvement. Now, how many people would have anticipated that that was the effect of using that scheme? Probably no one. You know, I've been doing this 14 years, and it's only in the last few years I've worked out how this works and what the effect is. So the point I'm trying to make, quite simply, is that we're using schemes we don't necessarily understand. This is quite interesting. This shows the effect. There's the blue line that we just looked at, 150% more for an excellent solution. But if you change the, the weight of price, so in that example, price was 40%, technical was 60%. If you change it to 70-30, so 30% price, then you get the red line. And suddenly, for your excellent solution, you're willing to pay 15 times as much what you're willing to pay for an acceptable solution. That is the mathematical consequence of using that way of doing an evaluation of suppliers. Okay? So the only point I'm trying to make, I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong or right, but I'm saying that vast, the vast majority of people who put those sorts of things in their ITTs, I think, don't fully understand the effect that they are having. Okay, the second thing I just want to try and demonstrate to you is that we use techniques that arbitrarily change the ranking of suppliers. For me, this is the particularly sho shocking one. Um, so if you were going to go and buy a car, you know, and you visited a BMW showroom and an Audi showroom or something, you test drive two cars, if, my, my proposition to you is, if we have a really good, robust way of knowing which is the best value for money car after considering all the factors, I should be able to rank those two cars in order. Okay? and be confident that order is going to stick. If I go to a Ford garage or a VW garage or something else, it shouldn't change my impression of whether the BMW or the Audi is the better car. And yet it does. Let me show you. So, very similar scheme, using the same formula for price, turning prices into scores, and we are still weighting price at 40% and technical at 
These are different tenders. I know the colours are the same, but they're different tenders. So again, if you, madam, if you could be the red tender. So we have one tender that scores 41 out of 60 for technical. I've done the evaluation of the red tender. It's a 40, 41 point technical solution. Thank you very much for your bid. Um, the green bid is a better bid. It's, a, it's, a more, it's a, going to be a more expensive but more capable bid, and it scores 54 points out of the 60 for technical. Okay? The red bid costs £5 million. Are you able to hold that in a different hand? Thank you. And the green bid costs £8 million. Okay? Now, before we go any further, we're going, to, if, if we're going to assume these are the two bids we've got at the moment. We're going to score them accordingly. Now, the red bid is the cheapest bid, so it gets all of the marks available for price, doesn't it? It gets all 40 points for price. The green bid is more expensive. It's £8 million pounds above, over £5 million. Pounds. And so it gets five-eighths of the points available, according to the formula. That's the way it works. Okay? And five-eighths of 40 is 25 points. Okay? By the way, I'm on stand 16 later. So if any of you are thinking, hang on a minute, he's pulling the wool over our eyes by going through this quickly and I don't believe the numbers, come and talk to me on the stand. The maths works, okay? If you can't, you know, if you're having trouble following it, just come and, uh, come and grab me later on. So this one gets 25 points for being five-eighths of the price is eight, eight million over five. So the red bid, what's your overall score, please, madam? It's 40 plus 41. 81 points for the red bid. Fantastic. The green bid, sorry, we need your overall score to be visible, please. So 54 and 25 points is 79 points. Okay? Everyone follow that. We have a winner. The winner is the red bid. Okay? It's a cheaper bid. It offers, apparently, better value for money. It's cheaper and good enough to be better value for money than the green bid. Okay? So we've ranked our two tenders. What I'm going to do now, though, is invite somebody else to come up, please. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, right at the last minute, we've just received a third tender, which is the blue tender. Okay, and this tender is uh, unfortunately not quite as good as the other tenders, but it gets 32 points out of 60, but it is very cheap. It's reasonably cheap. It's £4 million tender. Okay, so the, blue, the green tender has not changed, but I do need to rescore the overall price. I need to change, I need to rescore it for price. Okay, and the, the red tender has not changed either. Your price is the same, and your technical score is the same, okay? So we have these three tenders now. Let's work out the scoring. Now the blue tender is now the cheapest, okay? So it gets all 40 points for price. If you can hold that there, thank you very much. Its overall score is 40 plus 32 or 72 points, okay? The red tender is no longer the cheapest. It costs five million as opposed to the cheapest at four million. So it gets four-fifths of the points available. It gets 32 of the 40 points available for price. Overall score, 32 plus 41, is 73 points. The green tender is now twice as expensive as the cheapest. The blue was 4 million. This is 8 million. Okay? The green, ten green tender is now twice as expensive. So it gets half the marks for price. And so the green tender's overall score is now 74 points. And you can see what's happened. I'm sorry, but your tender is no longer the winner. The green is the winner. So I originally decided that the red tender was the winning tender and offered better value for money than the green tender. And then I changed my mind because a third tender that didn't win came in. If the blue tender was eliminated because it came in one minute after the deadline, then my red one is the winner again. How can that make sense? And how can I claim that my scoring scheme is offering, is correctly working out the value for money of these solutions and meaning I'm going to contract with the best value solution if my choice arbitrarily changes depending upon how many bids I've got. It's like deciding I'm going to buy the BMW, but right at the minute, last minute, I changed my mind to buy an Audi because I went to a Ford garage. So I think we use techniques that mean we don't even know how to rank our tenders reliably. I also think we do something else. This is starting to get quite mathematical. This one, I'm not going to try and prove. I haven't got time to prove it. You're going to have to come and grab me on the stand if you want me to go through the maths of this. But we do things that mean we don't even know how much we're going to pay for components of the bid. So quite a lot of customers, they, they normalize the technical score. So rather than giving the best technical, in that case, the best technical bid had, I don't know, whatever it was, uh, 43 points or something out of 60. 
what you do is normalize them, say the best technical get bid gets top marks and all of the others get a pro rata score. And when you do that, you end up with a horrible effect. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to explain all this. But apart from, just pick one of these lines, say that, uh, that red line. That red line shows how much more I'm willing to pay for a 4% increase in technical score. So one of my criteria might be 4%. That might be the scalability criteria. Okay? And what this is saying to me is sometimes I'm willing to pay nearly 40% more for that to be really good, and sometimes I'm willing to pay only 10%. It depends upon the other bids. That's like saying you don't know how much you're going to pay for metallic paint. It depends on which cars you go and look at. You, know, you might end up paying more for metallic paint on a BMW because you went to a Ford garage and looked at a Ford. It just doesn't make sense. But this is the, con the maths that flows from the way that we do those evaluations. So I think we use techniques that don't even allow us to know how much we're going to pay for one thing. It's like we, we have a question in the invitation to tender that says, tell me about security or tell me about scalability. And we don't know how much we could end up paying for that one thing. How can that be value for money? So I think we are all too often running procurements where we do not understand the result of the procurement. And certainly, therefore, the result is certainly something that we could not have intended. How can that be value for money? Now, do you want the good news or the bad news first? I'll, uh, okay, well, I'll go for the good news on the basis that I might have forgotten the bad news by the time I get to it. But um, the good news is bidders don't understand it either. It might sound not, not particularly good news, but it's good news for you if you're worried about being challenged. Bidders can't do the maths. Bidders haven't got the information they need to do the maths. They can't do it. So they are not going to challenge you, probably not. The bad news is you... Are not, what the bidders are not able to do is give you bids that are good value for money. All they are doing is they, if they know your budget, they're going to stick within the budget normally, and they're just going to write the best bid they can. So what you're getting are the solutions that are the best solutions you can afford. What none of the bidders are doing is going, oh, hang on a minute, I can see quite clearly that they're only willing to pay 50,000 quid for this, so we'll leave that out or we'll add it in or something. They're not optimising their bids. There's no conversation going on at any point in the process about what we want and what we value and what the bidders are going to give us. So we are not thinking about which questions to put in the invitation to tender to get the best value solutions. We're not thinking, do I ask for a solution that's scalable right up front? Or do I ask, to, do I ask a question that means I'm contracting with someone who can make it scalable when I need it to be scalable? We're using scoring techniques that mean we don't even know really what we're doing and how we're, what result we're going to get. And we're not giving the bidders the information they need to optimise their solutions. Effectively, there's no conversation going on. I'm not having an upfront conversation with the bidders about what I want and what I value, and I'm not doing it as part of the tendering process. How can we improve things? Well, the first thing I think we can do is we can pay more attention to getting those criteria right up front in the ITT. We can talk to bidders up front. We can discuss what we're thinking of putting in there with bidders in a way that doesn't jeopardise the competition. And we can decide to put a question in there that's aligned around, for example, contracting with someone who's going to build, make their solution scalable over three years as and when I need it. Uh, we can test those decisions with the supply base. We can get smarter about what we're putting in there. Uh, we, we, we have techniques for doing it. We're happy, very happy to, if you come to our stand later on, you can or go to our website, you can register to download white papers. We, you know, there's various white papers that talk about our method, SCD, which are all about doing that. And the other thing that we can do is we can use different techniques for dealing with price and technical and bringing them together. So we have a technique that we call relative value for money. Now, the problem with all the techniques that we've kind of just explored is that you start off by making some assumptions about how it's going to work, you know, how you're going to weight price, how you're going to do it. And then you have to do all the maths we've just done to work out the effect. Relative value for money just goes about it the other way. It means we start by just writing down what we want to pay for, what we value, and then the method just flows from it. So, for example, you'd say right up front, I'm willing to pay £50,000 for each increase in technical score of 1%. In other words, that safety thing, um, it's worth £300,000. That, secu you know, that security thing is worth £200,000. Uh, and then the method just puts that into practice. Um, it's relatively easy for buyers to get right. All you do is make that one decision, and that's the only decision you have to make. There's no testing to do. It's opaque, sorry, it's transparent to bidders. Bidders can see clearly what it means. They can optimise their bids. They can leave stuff in, put it in. 
The only bit that is difficult, in my experience, is getting people to, to come up with that number. It kind of forces you to write down on a bit of paper, no, one point is worth £50,000 or £100,000. People find that difficult. Strangely, what they find far easier is ignoring it, burying their head in the sand and saying, no, I'm not going to write that bit of number down. I'm just going to go with what I did before and end up paying two and a half times as much without even realising it. Thank you very much for your time. Hope it was of interest. And come and grab me if, uh, if you want to chat further. Thank you.